Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 207 for Monday, April 15th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Banzoogle. We're at Banzoogle.com. Promo code GIGGAB gets you 15% off your first year. We'll talk about why you'll want to use that in a little bit here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you today, Mr. <laughs> Kent? We had to skip last week, so uh, everything's everything's good? Much better. Yeah, I, I had a flu and I had a crazy high fever. And actually, for the first time in my existence i fainted hit my head and uh it was a pretty surreal thing i'm fine now this flu symptoms have gone but uh but man that was weird you know when something happens to you that, that has never happened before now you question you know what the heck's going on what, yep. what else don't i know yep oh totally yeah 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 well in in those moments and and i i've only experienced one of them when i hurt my back i guess it was last year about a year ago but where you have those moments where either pain or like you said, fever or whatever causes your body to sort of take over control from you. That's right. that's a that's a humbling thing to to experience. I mean, it, it, it does give you a lot of perspective, though. Um, but, you know, it does. Yeah. I will tell you one thing that I actually had the flu the night before when I had a gig and um, I was having all sorts of problems with my in-ears. But I, clearly my. uh Whatever it is in your in your personage that interprets sound waves and you know makes you keep pitch and those types of things was gone. I mean, I was like, oh. it was almost like I was underwater. I couldn't find pitch on some things. I couldn't hear very well. My head was kind of fogging up. So it was it was a weird, surreal experience. And I'm just you know I'm I'm fine now. And I, yeah, I you're on the other gig. side of it, right? Yeah. yeah. I played a gig on Saturday night. I, I played guitar only, which is another thing. First time ever with my own band that I haven't sung. Oh, wow. And it was so weird because the guys stepped up. They're like, you know, if you don't want to play the gig, don't play the gig. They did a set list of songs that Simon and Nick sing. They did a great job. Nick did a really, really exemplary job of emceeing the show. And uh, all I had to do was play the guitar. It seemed like the easiest thing in the world, man. Oh, yeah. Not having to worry about, you know, what song's coming up. And if I call this, if I call this audible, will this guy be bummed out because I'm substituting one of his songs? I mean, all the things that are kind of constantly going through my mind, uh, you know, what, what's the right thing? Do we have enough songs? What am I going to do? If, what, what am I going to do if we, if we end up a little short tonight? You know, just all the things that go when I'm running the show. Yes. To literally just grab my guitar and play it was the easiest, most effortless thing I can imagine. This is what great. I love great. about, uh, well, you know, several years ago when I was playing regularly with Chafed, but also playing regularly with Fling, the Fling gigs, I am that guy, right? Yeah. I run the show. I don't sing every song, but I probably sing, you know, 30 to 40 but percent of about it. Every song. But I'm worried about I Like, I am constantly thinking about what's next. Is this guy going to be like you said, is where's the crowd? What's happening? Like all of that stuff. And then I'd walk into these chafed gigs and I wouldn't like maybe they'd ask me to sing a song uh, or two, uh, but I am perfectly happy doing a gig. And just, you know, if, if I'm singing anything, it's harmonies. That's fine. Like I and and that blissfulness of being on stage and not having to worry. And like, like, it's not that I didn't have to worry. I had to worry about my playing. Yes. And nothing else. Part, it's like this is your great. Part and this song, it was, yeah. it was a, almost out of body experience to just kind of like yeah. be there, yeah. listening very carefully to exactly how I'm fitting in with my playing on everything. And right, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was it's a good a experience. It's a different perspective. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, uh, kudos to my guys. Before I move on, I have to say kudos to yeah. my guys. They just stepped in. They played a great show. Uh, it was such easy lifting. Great way for me to kind of come back in and see if I had anything left. The biggest thing I had. When I fainted, um, I hit 
I, I caught myself on a fall on my wrist and it's not broken. I had it x-rayed, but it's really sore. And so I actually played this one with a, with a wrist, um, kind of like a glorified ace bandage, kind of yep. a little bit bigger, tighter than ace bandage. And, and, you know, it was fine. It was a little tired at the end of the night, but clearly, you know, I haven't broken anything. That's good. Yeah. And, and that is something to be said that you like the fact that it wasn't that you stepped into a different band and were able to just be, you know, the, the side man or, or whatever you want to call it. Right. But you were stepping into your, your own band that your normal scenario where you are that person, the fact that the rest of your band was able to step up enough to where you didn't feel like you had to be worried about that stuff. That's yeah. impressive. That really yeah. is. Yeah. Well, that's the value of a 20 year unit. Yep. You know, you've got the depth of, of repertoire. You've got, you know, you're, you're polished. I mean, there were, there were some, Harmony things that were just not there just sounded empty or, or of weird. course, you know, who, you know, who noticed it? You none, not none people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're the one. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it's a, it's, and that's, I, I think a lot again about the value of a band as opposed to like, you know, a guy with a bunch of backing people or, you know, the, the business process of having interchangeable parts, you know, there, there's a, there's a business approach to that, right? I never sure. have to worry about, you know, people not being available. I've always got three deep They're They're all moderately aware of my show. Right. That, right. But, right. But right. You, I don't know. It would be so frustrating because it would never be as good as it could possibly be. Right. Totally. On any given night, you know, one part would be a little bit different or a little bit less rehearsed or a little bit polished or whatever it might be. I, my band makes me crazy often but I am, it is not lost on me the value of everybody kind of sticking it through and, um, you know, working through stuff to keep the whole thing going. Yeah, we, the camaraderie. We, we, and benefit, the, yeah. we benefited from it. So, and also just the, the ability to drop this thing in so many, di- you know, situations and, you know, have a good time and play some music, make some money. I mean, j- just that it is a real ongoing polished predictable, you know, well, that that predictability uh, is the thing. I mean, it, you haven't had to experience it. So you you don't know this like viscerally, but I know intellectually you do that if you had a essentially a permanent pickup band like you described, uh, there would be an additional level of stress going into every gig like you and, and additional level of work. Not only would you have to coordinate who you're going to have, but it's like, OK, here's the set list. Here's this like you can. I mean, I know you do your set list for your gigs with the house rockers, but that's a very different thing. It's not like I don't need to worry. Does that guy know this song? Has exactly. he ever played that song with us? Like the, and then you're on stage and you're like, well, I know he says he's played that song with us, but I don't remember. You know, uh, the, here like, we go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my so. um, horns have, have been asked. um when the temptations and the four tops have come through town, they don't, they don't carry a full band. They hire locals. Yeah. Um, they get them in a room the day of the show. Uh, they do carry a musical director and the musical director goes over the charts with them. You don't play a note. You just literally just read down the show and then you get and go. That's a different thing. What I'm talking about is at this semi professional level. Right. Right. It's really a warm body filling, you know, some more qualified than other. That's right. But it's literally, can, can there be some bass notes throughout the evening so it doesn't sound ridiculously weird? Is, you know, is the kind of problem that you're typically solving. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've talked a little bit about perception here. Just in case those of you listening are worried, no, what Paul had in terms of his perception is not contagious over the air, over the podcast waves. I don't know what we call these. Over the ether. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I did want to point out, because I know, you know, we have a lot of critical ears listening, that we are running this through a completely new uh, mixer setup here. Uh, My Mackie Onyx 1220 Firewire mixer, which I've been using to record podcasts in this studio for, oh, 14 years now, 13 and a half years, uh, died. It has been slowly dying. This was not a surprise, but uh, on Thursday night I or Thursday afternoon, Lisa was up here in the studio doing some of our accounting work, and she sent me a Slack message and said, hey, I can't get any sound. And I knew. I didn't even have to come Did up you? and check. What's that? What, uh, 
What sound did she need to do the accounting work again? So she likes, likes to listen to music while she's working. And oh, she okay. couldn't get any sound to come out of the computer. Yeah, no, that's a fair, that's a fair question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but, you know, she also wasn't getting like notification sounds or anything like that. And I was like, okay, I know what the problem is. Like this thing's been failing. In fact, I had even texted a friend saying, uh, you know, if I don't replace it's it's like telling me, Dave, you should replace me soon or you're going to regret it. Um and thankfully, at even at 5 p.m., I was able to get online. I had to pick very quickly, but thankfully, there's essentially one option that's a drop-in replacement for a FireWire mixer. Not a lot of them exist, but Behringer still makes one. It's the UFX 1204. So it was a drop-in replacement in terms of like the way it works and the way it fits in the setup here, uh, both physically and, more importantly, electronically. And uh, And that showed up Saturday morning, thanks to Amazon Prime and... We're up and running and but, you know, EQs and gain structure are all a little bit different. We're going to be tweaking as as time goes on. So if you have any feedback about that, of course, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. But I just wanted to mention it because, A, I know we all kind of like gear here. And so I figured I'd mention it. But also, I know you've heard some of you have heard the difference. So um, so there you go. Fun. Cool. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad it all. Enjoy like, your new toy. It's a new toy. Yeah, exactly. It's like I'm hoping that I don't hit solo instead of mute. Like if I have to cough, but. You know, there's a couple things. I say it's a drop in replacement. It is. But, you know, some of the buttons are in slightly different spots. <laughs> so we did not get to talk about this madhouse that I did. We talked about it. Uh, it's sort of the day of my my rehearsal. But I, I don't. I, there are folks that listen to this show that come to Madhouse. And so I don't like to talk about all the details of it because a lot of people like to show up at Madhouse and be surprised by, you know, the song selection and how things are working and, and all of that. And so, uh, because it's this episodic thing, right? That no two Madhouses are the same. In fact, other than some asterisk moments, we've never repeated a song in Madhouse. And, and you know, uh, it's so people like to show up and, and experience it without, you know, any preconceived notions. I happen to live with one of these fans. So it's really even weirder because I can't listen mm. to the songs to prep while my wife's around. I mean, I could, but, you know, by and large, I try not to. But um, so this most recent one, I think I had mentioned the the topic and the title of it was Madhouse Tribute to the Queen. And uh, so for the first act, we did, you know, some Madonna tunes and and uh, and, you know, Aretha and, and uh, you know, Queens, right, of 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 music. And that, and that was great. And then as the the storyline dictated, we changed from tribute to the queen to tribute to queen. Nice. nice. Well, so here's the thing, though, Paul, if you or I were in charge of picking the songs for something like this, you or I, because we know better, would never choose to do 11 queen songs mm. in one night with one rehearsal. Like, yeah. that's just a crazy idea because every queen song, even like under pressure where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Well, yeah, you're no problem through that that verse section, but like the B section is completely different yeah, and has this crazy. Whole, it's crazy. Yeah. It's orchestral. Like, it's orchestral. It's three different songs in one. And you and I would even if we were forced gun to the head, you know, forced to do this, you or I would never pick to do Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> and if we were to be forced to do Bohemian Rhapsody, we knowing what we know would say, OK, but we're going to do it the way Queen did it and have the first part of it tracked with the whole, you know, uh, Scott, that whole Galileo yeah, yeah. thing. Queen never has done that live ever. Mm. They track that part and then they come in with a bound, you know, and that whole that whole thing. Yeah. So the Wayne's World part, the Wayne's World part. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, you and I are not the ones that picked the songs or how they would be done for this show. The Mad Men are. And the Mad Men are musicians, certainly, but not not musicians like like we are and don't, don't think about things this way. And they're like, oh, the band could do this. And we have a lot of singers and the band can sing. So we can do the whole, you know, Galileo and that all that stuff. <laughs> That's no problem. We can. That'll be fine. And one rehearsal should be more than enough. Oh, gosh. You know what, man? It worked like it, 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 the, the theater magic fairy dust got sprinkled on us that evening and everything worked. I mean, it was not That's perfect, amazing. but it was amazing. And it really was something special to be a part of. Um, the good news was that 
we all, even if we hadn't played the songs before, which for most of these songs, we really hadn't, but we knew them. So there was no question of how does this go? It was more of a question of how do we ever approximate playing what we know right. it should sound like, but at least we knew what it was, what it should sound like. And, uh, and it was really special. Uh, we did, we opened the second act just to, and this might give you sort of a, a picture of what uh, Madhouse is. I always say it's like live music videos and, and for Bohemian Rhapsody, they actually acted out the song and the, this, the guy who sang the lead on the tune it was like captured by shadows and there was this whole shadow puppet thing. And it was really, it was re remarkably well done. <laughs> I'll share it. Lisa took a video of it. I'll share it to our, our gig gab uh, group on gig podcast.com slash Facebook. But for the second act, we opened it with just the band playing and singing somebody to love. And, uh, and it was, oh, yeah. And, uh, and it was um, the, the performance were these two people that we've worked with many, many, they're part of our, you know, group there uh, who do this aerial stuff. And so they were doing this silks routine suspended from the ceiling while we're singing somebody to love. And I mean, it's just like, it's like, when do you get to be a part of something like this? It was pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and the coolest part was I was worried about the end of the tune where there's those find me somebody to love, you know, I'm like, am I going to be the Did only you sing one? It all? Well, I sang, I sang most of it. I didn't sing the leads on it. Susie, our keyboard player sang the lead on that particular song, but you know, I was singing harmonies with her and Jamie, our bass player was also singing. And so we get to that part and I'm thinking, is it just going to be me and Jamie? Like this is this, it's going to sound empty. And in my ears, and from backstage, the entire cast, you know, and there's like 14 yeah. of us that do this madhouse. Yeah. And these people, I can sing just fine. These people can actually sing, you know. So the interesting thing I'm guessing right there is this is the benefit of music that has become coded into people's DNAs. You almost instinctively, I bet that thought was going through everybody in the hall, every yes. participant. And it was like, this is the big thing. Everyone's got to sing this part and you just do it. Right. Yep. This is. The, and, and, and you, know, you talk about. Uh, how hard it is to write a hit song, right? Yeah. Right, write one hit song. Write a song that becomes part of of a whole generation or two or three. I was going to say multi generational. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That that's that's pretty magic stuff there. So and and that's why it's, it actually doesn't surprise me. You know, it's like it's like watch a hundred thousand people air guitar. You know, the guitar solo to Stairway to Heaven. Yes, they know every nuance of that. Even if you don't play guitar, you know every nuance of that of that guitar solo. There's you know, songs and I don't want to have... spoil anything, but if you are into that kind of thing that Paul just described, you might want to come to the next Madhouse. I'm, I don't uh, want to spoil anything, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that that's kind of cool, and and those are those serendipitous. It was totally music, serendipitous musical magical moments that that a great song will do. I mean, we all are incredibly impressed with ourselves as musicians, but at the end of the day, a song is the most precious commodity. A great song, Not, you know, a yep. great solo, all for it, everything like that. But really when a song captures people's imagination and captures people's hearts and souls like that, where you just, when you are given the opportunity, you emote it. That's, that's about as magical and musical it, moment. It, as it you was, can imagine. it was so, it was awesome. Cause I just went up to the mic and it was like, you know, I leaned into the mic. I mean, I'm playing the drums. It's right there, but it was like, all right, well, I'm going to sing. Cause I, you know, somebody has got to sing this and I hope Jamie's going to sing it, but I don't remember us rehearsing this part of it, you know, and I start singing and it was as though I had like someone had applied the most perf perfect chorus, you know, effect to my voice. And it was like, oh, there they are. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. People are really on this. Yeah, I, It's an interesting thing. We can take this conversation, bend it a little bit to the left. And I don't think enough cover bands um, uh, think about sing along as valuable as dance music, right? Oh, no, like you in have every to have show and every set. I do. I think so too. I think, you know, there are a lot of people who don't like to dance, but even if you're deep in your chair, bar chair, lawn chair, whatever it is, if it's that song, you know, you, you really can connect with people, even if they're not there to dance. And, and, you know, there are a lot of songs that can serve that purpose. Oh, and you have to have them. Even in our uptown set list, we have, I mean, don't stop believing is not a song that people will dance to right. necessarily. But it's a sing along. Well, they will chant. They will chant. And and every Steve Miller song like fits that that mold too, right? Because everybody knows those lyrics and just sings yeah. along. 
and maybe not every Steve Miller's, but you get my point. There's enough of them. And and when people start getting a little, you know, too tipsy or whatever, the sing alongs toward the end of the night can be a thing. We do Born to Run, believe it or not, for that reason in, cool. in Uptown yeah. and uh, and Bon Jovi's uh, living on a prayer. That's, you know, like you got to have those sing alongs. Yeah. 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 I think. I think they're incredibly valuable to your show. I think they they are the, they are a tactic for getting those who don't like to dance connected. Totally. Like you may have captured them that they're not dancing, but they're enjoying the music. But if you really want to get their heart and soul, find something that they you know in whatever state of inebriation they may be. Sure. That, you know, just gets it out of them. Yeah, get Which it out of them. Works really. You know, it's a funny song. It seems to work every time, whether it's full band, solo acoustic. American Pie seems to just. Oh. You know, it just yeah. takes people to some place. Again, you talk about a song that just got, it, it is a long, long, long song, yeah. but it really seems to still connect with people, you know, 50 years later. It, it's true. Yeah. That's multi-generational. Yeah. Brown Eyed Girl's another one. You know, you got the sha la 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 las Margaritaville. Yeah, it, Margaritaville. I've always said that, you know, Journey uh, wrote a lot of these kind of sing along things. I mean, who, who writes a song that goes na, 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 huh. right? But like, you know, like n no one in their garage would write that outro for a song, right? You have to already be playing arenas and say, oh, I have this idea. This will be great, right? Everybody will sing this thing with us. Right. You wouldn't do, you know, it's like like uh, Queen's We Will Rock You, right? It was written be because they were already playing arenas and it was like a thing. Like, oh, we can do this thing and, and the crowd's part of our show. So let's give them something to do, you know, that that kind of thing. But yeah, I've always, I've always thought about that. Like there's no garage bands writing songs like that because I did, you know, you, you don't, people aren't going to know your song when you, when you show up at the club for the first time, you know, <laughs> right, it's like, right. it's just not how it works. Yeah. All right. So speaking of engaging with our listeners, I have uh, a question from Andy. We were talking in the last episode two weeks ago about playing gigs where volume has to be low. And I, I mentioned, as a drummer using different sticks and uh, and Andy wrote in and has a couple of things to say. This is just a recommendation for Dave to try for playing acoustic drums quietly. These are Boso drumsticks, B-O-S-O drumsticks.com. He says, I use their two B's made of bamboo and found them to be excellent for quiet playing in the range uh, between bundles and my usual hickory sticks. And hickory is what most drumsticks are made out of. There's other, obviously other woods out there, but um, he says the Boso sticks with the bamboo take a little while to get used to, but they have a softer feel and an immediately notable, noticeable difference in playing volume. He says they still give you the stick feel, but with much less attack. He says, I use them for practices when the band wants or needs to be at a lower volume. And sometimes for the first few songs at a restaurant gig or whatever it is. So thank you, Andy. That's, that's great. I, um, I have found my go-to for these has become the Vader sweet ride. And they're hickory sticks. They're thin. But the, I think for me, the biggest difference is the, the shape of the bead. Um, it, I normally like to play with a teardrop bead, uh, you know, a teardrop shaped bead, which is a much, much more surface area, right? To hit things, especially hitting cymbals. Uh, and it does bring out a, a lot more sound out of the cymbal. With the, these Vader sweet rides, they are, uh, it's, a, it's a, like a, a tight circular bead, if you will, like almost like a BB kind of thing. And it gets a lot of ping without a lot of volume. So I can really get like the, the attack of the instrument without having to bring out volume from it. And, and those work um, really well for me too. But Paul, just serendipitously in the last week, yes. I have found, I think I have found my Holy grail. <laughs> when I started playing the drums, when I was a kid, there was this company called Capella, C-A-P-P-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, making drumsticks out of New Jersey. And it just so happened that my they became the they were the manufacturer for the house brand at my local music store called Norwalk Music because uh, I lived in Norwalk, Connecticut. And they had these sticks. It started as a 5A and then all their sticks got thinner and there were some quality control problems with Capella throughout their history. But um, so this was just my the beginning of me experiencing this. But uh, so I moved from their 5As to their 5Bs. And uh and these sticks just felt right in my hand, you know, and they were as when I moved away, they were kind of hard to find. And I would I would have I, would, I started using all other sticks 
And then I would find a box where I had a few of these Capellas in them and I'd pick them up and be like, oh yeah, like that's, they just, they're balanced right. They feel right. They're the right thickness from, I got big hands, you know, they're, they're the right, they're just the right everything for me. And I tried to have some sticks made a couple of years ago and we found out that the uh, Capella, Capella has now gone out of business. I was buying sticks. I just started buying sticks directly from them and I did that for a number of decades uh, but then they went out of business maybe 10 years ago. I bought their mm-hmm. entire stock of, of five B's from them and I still have some, but their quality control issues were pro- far more prevalent, uh, especially when you're buying everything that's left over. Right. And so these sticks are okay, but you know, I'm going to run out. And so I had these sticks made and this guy figured out. Is that a normal thing? I've never heard of a drummer actually having custom sticks made. Is that a common thing? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look, there are um, sticks with, uh, you know, famous drummer like drumstick companies that make sticks for someone who has a brand name uh, will often sell those sticks as you can buy, you know, the near near peer model, which is really just a Pro 747. But, uh, you know, like they'll they'll, they'll, they will do these. And a lot of those are not just some other model rebranded. It is. Oh, I like this. But could you shave this off or make it a quarter inch shorter or whatever? Right. So, yeah, I mean, drummers are very much a part of the design process of these sticks. It's very much a part of your sound and your playing style and everything like you. A stick can be sticks are different lengths. Sticks are different thicknesses. They're different materials, as we mentioned. And uh, so I. But is that like a. a, a beyond the reach of most average drummers or this is common enough where most people are serious about drumming enough that they're or gigging I'm not saying serious most most gigging drummers you know you pay an extra two or three bucks you know per set and, and you can have exactly what you want yeah actually it, if you wind up buying them in bulk you wind up paying less but you know ah. yeah 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 so yeah. I, I would say it's probably not most but it's not totally uncommon maybe 20 percent of the gigging drummers out there do this Got you it. know right yeah so i found this guy who's like this drumstick savant and he happened (laughs) to be out of work and he had a, you know, a lathe, a drumstick lathe in his house, in his garage. And he, uh, he understood the entire, like he and I had like a three hour conversation about drumsticks and all this. And I told him what I had and he's like, Oh, I know those. He says, so when Capella went out, Vic Firth bought their blades and they use the same blades for the five B. So I can, I can make you the same sticks. It's like, great. Outstanding. That's what I want. So he did. He made one up and he didn't glaze it yet, you know, because he's like, I want to make sure this is right. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, you know, it needs the glaze. It needs to be a little thicker. But but yeah, the, like the balance and everything like here we are. Thank you, Jeff. Right. And then he started telling me, well, you know, I don't like glazing in my garage because it, you know, it like it actually gets you kind of high. And, you know, he's like, that's not really good for me. He's like, so maybe I'll just do beeswax on him to give him some grip for you. I'm like, oh, OK, well, do like a set or two. And I would pay him for these one offs, you know, as we were iterating together or whatever, I'm like do a set or two for me. And let, let me make sure I was like, no, they're, they're not thick enough. So he made them a little thicker, which changed the weight. But it was OK. So I bought us. I bought like 100 sticks. Fine. My daughter really likes them because she um, her hands get sweatier than mine when she plays. So she kind of liked the drier stick. And uh, so it's, like, it's fine, you know, whatever. And uh, but I've I've always known that when I grab a pair of those Capellas, it's it, it's much better than even the customs that I had made. And I stumbled onto something that and I've tried the, the Vic Firth 5Bs, but they they weren't quite the same until they mm-hmm. released the Vic Firth 5B double glaze. And that's the trick. It's the extra glaze. Capella must have just overglazed their sticks by default. Maybe. Who knows? And uh, man, I, I grabbed him. And I was like, oh, come to Papa. Because <laughs> not only are they what I'm used to, but they're from Vic Firth and they balance every stick pair. And there's no like wobbly sticks or out of balance sticks from Capella because Capella's quality control was just not part of their lexicon i guess there so uh so i'm really excited so i gotta get in touch with with vic firth and and like you know get a bunch of these because it's it's time it's like thank goodness it's, I, good it's been you. so long since i've been excited about a drumstick so yeah that's yeah, cool yeah, it's good yeah it's good and it's, it's a regular good. production stick you can buy them whenever and how out and how much bulk you want well i'm a little worried to be perfectly honest because it's a new thing 
And I know how new things go. Sometimes they become permanent things in the lineup and sometimes they don't. So this is why I want to get in touch with Vic Firth and, you know, have him do a run and have Dave send him a big check and you just send me a big box <laughs> and then I'm good until I have to, you know, find the next person that'll make them for me. So, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But Ooh. I'm excited about it. So which is, you know, it's good. <laughs> it's a little thing. Yeah. But it makes such a difference. Of course. It, you wouldn't think so. Uh, you, you know, like, I mean, but it does. It's it's but, like, yeah, it's in your hands, right? It is literally it, in my hands. It Like my drums are not in my hands. My sticks are what are what, what are in my hands. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Strings for me, like sure. I'm particular about strings. Nothing brings me more joy than a new set of strings. And when I find, you know, strings that are balanced and toned in such a way that there's just the right amount of brightness and just the right amount of sustain strings are what do it. So I totally get what you're saying because yep. my fingers are on the strings. Your fingers are on the strings. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So very cool stuff. Hey, uh, I want to take a minute before we get into everything else that we're going to talk about here. And I want to talk about our sponsor, which is Banzoogle. Yay. Uh, yeah, right. So I, I said it at the beginning of the show, but I'll, I'll say it again so we don't lose sight of it. But um, Banzoogle.com is where you'll go and you can try it for free for 30 days. And then uh, we have a promo code for you, GigGab. There's three G's in that, G-I-G-G-A-B. You get 15% off your first year. Now, why why Banzoogle? What is Banzoogle, Paul? What is yes. Banzoogle? You use Banzoogle. I do use Banzoogle. And it's you know one of those great serendipitous things that I was a Banzoogle user and I was bragging about it on, on the show and they heard it and they said, hey, you guys are doing something cool. It is really wonderful to have them as a sponsor because I am an extremely satisfied customer. The first thing about Banzoogle is this is clearly an organization that uh, is run by musicians. Everything about the approach, about how you explore the site, how you pick uh, a theme, um, the services are just right for all different types of musicians. They get musicians and they get music and they get gigging and they get, you know, they get the types of things that musicians want to communicate to their audience. So that's the first thing that it's built by smart people who are clearly musicians, know to speak the language of musicians, uh, and they've built a service that reflects that really well. The thing is, you know, your website, and I've been saying this more and more, Facebook is not your friend. You may think you're getting a lot of followers, but they're going to charge you to get at your followers. If you want to control your destiny, you're going to double down and get your website and your mailing list working for you. And, you know, that way you are insured that you can talk to your audience how and when and at, at the cost that you choose. Um, so having a great website... And the thing about Banzoogle sites that I think is wonderful is it's all the little professional edges, the very subtle little animations. They have dozens, dozens of themes. So you can, not everybody's looks the same um, and you can choose. And then you add in um, the services that you want. You want to have a gig calendar? Do you want to show some videos? Do you want to uh, sell stuff? Um, do you want to sell tickets? Do you want to sell merchandise? Uh, do you want to have uh, demos and stuff up? You, you kind of drag in these widgets. It's tremendously easy. And when you're done, you have this incredibly polished very, very professional asset that is representing your band. Again, little things like the way that images just kind of animate as they come up, um, the amount of information that you can include in your gig calendar, not only where and when, but, you know, if you want to have a link to a map, if you want to have any special graphics associated with your gig calendar, all these little type of subtle things. And again, it all goes back to that. It's a service built for musicians by musicians that makes it just wonderful. So I'm extremely happy customer band Zoogle. I'm really glad that they're here with us as a sponsor. I can't recommend it enough. You don't have to know anything about coding HTML email or anything like that. It is literally dragging and dropping and then populating, you know, uploading videos, uploading photos, entering your gig calendar, you know, however you want to use your site for you. And you end up with something you can be really proud of, represents your band and your brand, you know, in a really, really fantastic way. Everybody does not look like everybody else. So it's not really hom homogenous like that. Um, and it just works. So That's awesome. Easy, easy, beautiful, and useful. I mean, I don't think you can say too much more about what you want your website life to be. We don't want to spend our life thinking about building websites. We just want it to be up and out there for the world to see. Well, and and you want it to be dynamic, right? So with things like, you know, easily updated calendars and videos like you're doing with uh, exactly. svhouserockers.com. If you folks want to see an example, we'll put a link in the show notes. But uh, that's a Banzoogle site and you're able to keep it fresh without a lot of work. And that is really the key to keeping people coming back. And, and all that stuff. So check it out. And we, yeah. Just two more things. You yeah. know, the, the ability yeah. to give your, uh, have potential leads, you know, message you and um, the ability for you to grow your mail list right on your site are really great. And so, 
The services are built. They're just smart. It has absolutely everything you need. It does integrate with social media if you wanted to do that, but um, it really gives you all that you need in order to have a complete turnkey online business, essentially, for your website, for your brand, for your band. Cool. Your band. That's right. At Bandzoogle, B-A-N-D-Z-O-O-G-L-E dot com. And use promo code GIGGAB, G-I-G-G-A-B, to get 15% off your first year. And as Paul said, our thanks to Bandzoogle for sponsoring the episode. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I had a gig on Saturday night with Uptown Celebration. It was our first gig in a while. Uh, we had kind of taken the winter off for a little bit here. But things are actually heating back up with that band, which is a, which I'm, which is a welcome thing. Our um, our female singer moved to uh, to Vermont, and so we have uh, I, I, I'll say a new singer. She's new permanently to the band, but she is uh, someone that has gigged with us before and filled in before in the past. And uh, and it was a it was a good gig. It, uh, it actually a really good gig. We had a couple of rehearsals leading up to it. It was the first gig where this band for me has felt like a band. You know, where we were all we had a lot of new songs that we had learned together. So it wasn't just here's the set list I inherited when I, you know, when I joined, let's go just do the show. Let me ask you a question about this. Yeah. Do do all the people in the band want it to feel like a band? Yes. Is it? All right. So there is a desire for this to be a more communal thing, not just a collection of pros who who show up and play. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what it always had been. It just, you know, I was the new guy and there wasn't, you know, Gary, our, our leader was also opening a restaurant at the time that like almost exactly in sync with when I joined the band. So he didn't have a whole lot of time. And so by nature, the band didn't have a whole lot of time together other than these gigs, which, you know, in uh, over time do become this, you know, shared crisis, right? You know, you, you have some experiences together and that's good, but, sure. um, but you know, this, this gig, especially with new tunes, I finally learned how to sing with Marty, our, our, uh, our male singer, he and I have finally done some songs together where it's like, OK, now we can sing together. We did um, we had rehearsed Tom Petty's Listen to Her Heart. I'm not sure if we played that at the gig or not, but, you know, that and like Mama Don't Dance, actually, which I mentioned in a previous show, went mm-hmm. over really well. Uh, and Jet Airliner, you know, these songs where we're always singing together. It's like, OK, finally, we had an opportunity to learn, you know, how each other's inflections work and that sort of thing. So. It, it, in that sense, it was really good. And the band was really tight. We added uh, with Rachel because she sings it. Gladys Knight's rendition of uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine. Mm. Great song. But uh, we like to keep the show moving, as a lot of dance slash party bands do. And so that song starts with four measures of drums with this kind of weird syncopated sort of, you know, doom, bat, doom, bat, doom, bat, you know, and then. It comes out of that and she's in on the one with, I bet you're wondering how I knew, you know, and Mm -hmm. bet is on the one. So she's got to pick it up out of that. And I do a little fill or whatever. And in rehearsal, it always worked. But you know how it is at the gig. There's Mm -hmm. a lot more stuff going on. And so I hit that one and then she went, I bet you're wondering. And immediately Mm -hmm. it was like, okay, she's Uh an entire beat off. And it was I had to make a split second decision of am I right? Or is she right? Because the band's going to follow me, you know? And it was like, she's right. She's the one singing the song. She's right. So we now have a measure of five and Mm -hmm. I played the measure of five and kind of listened and looked around the stage and everybody, you know, all eyes to me and we locked in and then, you know, by measure halfway through measure two, everything's fine. (laughs) But it was this, as Gary described it, it was one of those moments where, you know, you throw all the rocks up in the air and see how they land, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was one of those, it was just such a weird moment to have this, you know, potential train wreck right at the beginning of a tune, but it was good. Right. Cause everybody like, you know, that's the sign of pros is that, you know, you realize there's a problem and you fix it right away. And everybody doesn't matter who's right. As long as we're all right. That's right. doesn't matter doesn't matter yep. but we had a horn player man we don't <laughs> always have horn players so horn players in uptown are by definition subs or fill-ins or whatever you want and this guy because he's a sub or a fill-in or whatever you want to call him uh is paid that way he doesn't he's not expected to be there for setup or tear down or any of that stuff so he got there midway through you know this this event we had to get there early and set up like we normally do and this was a corporate event. It was a company's 30th anniversary party. It was really nice. They always take good care of us. We've done this gig from several times. And uh, 
and not their 30th anniversary because they only get one of those, but their annual party we've done several <laughs> times. And, uh, and so he, you know, he had dinner with us and, and all of that. And it was great. And, you know, we got to, I, the other guys had played with them before I never had, uh, but you know, we got to chit chat and it was fine and we're going and getting on stage. And, and he asked Dave, our sound guy, uh, the other Dave, he says, uh, you know, do I, do, uh, do I just plug in here or whatever? And Dave's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. And he had a clip on mic for his, his saxophone. I was like, okay, cool. And I'm kind of noticing, you know, but it's like things are happening quickly because it's time to play. Like he has no music stand, nothing. Okay. Well, whatever. You know, he asked Gary, he's like, you have a copy of the set list, man. And, and Gary's like, yeah, it's the same one I emailed around. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, but here's one. It's like, okay, cool. Thanks. He's like, I just like to see the keys or whatever the songs are in. <laughs> like, uh, okay, like uh, fine. Like, but yeah, everybody, no, everybody's calm, but I'm a little curious about all this. And we start the gig and he was right on with every part to wow. every song. If we were playing a tune where we were singing harmonies, he would hear what was missing and add it in on the horn. Like it, this guy. And so, and it was great. So who and was he? It's this guy, Cam. I, I don't even know he's his last a local name. Guy, just like, you know, yeah. is he a ex touring pro? Is he a, he's done the cruise ship circuit. Musician? Yep. He is a full-time musician. He teaches at two different schools. Um, but he, you know, it was amazing. He was, um, when he was taking a lead or something, he was like, he was right up on at the front of the stage, ripping a lead. Yeah. Otherwise he would like fade back and hang between Victor and I, our, our bass player and just like groove along and, and jam with us and, uh, and fill in here and there. It, but he like, no one watching this band would know that this guy wasn't a part of the band. Like he That's stepped great. in and knew that he could not be the one to bring it down a notch just because he was playing with us for, let's say the first time, that's yeah. irrelevant. No one out there cares, nor should they even know. Right. And so at the end of the gig, I'm like, all right, like we got to talk here. Like, this is freaking amazing. <laughs> like, this is great. I said, you stepped in, you don't have any charts. You're picking everything up. Our, our last tune was a request. So it was not on any set list that we had talked about. The, the people requested brown eyed girl to sing along with. And, uh, and so I'm trying to ask Gary, like, do we do it in G man? Like it's in G Right. Normally we do it in G and I can't get his attention. I turned to Cam who was standing right next to me. I'm like, I'm trying to get the key for you. He's like, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll hear it. It's fine. Don't, you know, don't sweat it. And of course, like at the, at the outset, he's playing the, the lead along with Gary and then he drops into a yeah. harmony of it, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, so this is great. Like you didn't have any, any charts or anything. And he's like, yeah, man, you know, I don't get it. These horn players that demand having charts. He's like, that's not how guitar players learn music. So I don't know how they're going to get work if they're going to demand having all that stuff, because most bands aren't going to be able to provide that. Right. And he says, so I decided to approach playing the horn like a guitar player approaches playing the guitar. He says, I know all the other stuff. He's like, of course, I can read and everything. He said, but I sort of had to relearn and know that I can follow a chord chart and, and hear melodies in my head and play them on my instrument, just like a guitar player can hear melodies and sort of play them. He says, you know, you just get better at that stuff. The more and more you do it. And, and he really, and, and when he said that, I was like, yeah, he really was. It was as though we had dropped another guitar player. And it's just that this guitar player happened to play saxophone. Like right. it was that type of a vibe. Like, Oh yeah, yeah. He just sets his stuff up and, and goes, it's good to go. That's it. So yeah. I will give you my experience with horns, right? They're yeah, a different I know. breed in general. I know. Right? Yeah. So, uh, I know horn bands that don't have charts and the horn players just have to figure out like everybody else in the band has to figure out. For you know, this guy, to be fair, he didn't have to figure out parts for four people. Right. It right. was, it was just him. So he had some leeway there for sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's also a lot of horn players who are, they're married to their charts. They really are. They're really, you know, and I think when you play in a section, you are accountable for like perfect intonation and perfect choices. Sure. And so that's a little bit different, Yeah, but I think it's awesome. You know, that, that uh, approach of coming in and saying, look, you know, if you hire me, I have a big repertoire. I kind of know the songs. I'll, I'll have big ears. So I'll listen. So I'm not stepping on anybody. Of course that makes sense for anything I've come, but horn players are just different cats. I, I mean, know. Yeah. Again, they, they, they but this is not a universal. It doesn't have to be a truth that we accept. And horn players are the ones that need to start with changing this perception. Well, I'll give you a good story about this. So yeah. we had one gig where um, 
it, it came up late. It was a really high paying gig and it was in San Francisco. So it was you know about 50 miles from here, but it was a corporate gig. We had like a week's notice and uh, most all except for one of my guys was not available. So, but who was available is guys who have subbed for me over, over the years. One guy plays for Huey Lewis in the news. One guy plays for Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, we had a, a dream team yeah. of a horn section there. And I kind of got to experience what horns of that level with that, those types of ears and those types of, you know, uh, chops for figuring stuff out on, in a rock band, you know, on a moment's notice, yeah. we had stuff that didn't have horn charts. And by the middle of the first verse, they had a full horn chart you know, yeah. figured out where they were just following, you know, the lead guy. And it was just sublime, incredible. And so, yeah, it is possible, but uh, it's but not it just how takes most, a different mindset. Yeah. It's not how most of them are, are, you know, raised or trained. Well, they're raised to play in big bands. Correct. I mean, that's kind of like they want to be jazz players and they think about playing in big bands because that's where horn players go often. Uh, it, it, you know, that's the path for many of them. Now, now there's less big bands now, but again, a horn player, what do you do? You, you, you know, you pick it playing up in, in school. school orchestra. Exactly. And band and stuff. You're playing no. in or- in- yep. But to be, so, to be fair, guitar players, that's generally not the path. It's certainly not excluded. There, there are often guitar players, at least in stage band or jazz band or a studio orchestra or something, but generally not in the marching band and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but drummers, you know, like that's how I was raised, but also simultaneously I was playing in rock bands. And I, right. I wonder if this guy was, you know, kind of doing that, that double path at the same time. Um, but you, you know, but cause, because you need to have that experience of, Oh, right. Like I can read a chart. That's great. That makes me useless in this scenario. I need to, sure. you know, like that kind of thing. I, I figured that out when I was 15, you know, it was like, Oh, right. You're not going to have a chart and I have Born to, it, it's, and, and yeah, so maybe, maybe he had that, you know, uh, but it was really, it was a, a pleasure. I mean, I can't wait for the next, he's playing with us on a couple more gigs. Is he your first months. call for this? He is absolutely the band's first call for this. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And, and I, now I understand why, <laughs> because they don't have to think about it. They just, you, you know, know, Mendoza in my band is exactly that way. Oh, put a charge for him, He'll read it down, yep. put him in, put him in any group, you know, and he, he's got a big repertoire. He's been playing, you know, cover music in top 40 music for a long time. He has great knowledge and repertoire. He just, knows where to play and where not to play. And, yeah. you know, obviously when it's time for solo, he knows to step up and, and rip it. And yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, that's great. I, I think, yeah. 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 It's a good thing. Uh, hopefully this is, you know, Mendoza's is a little younger than we are. This guy was a little younger than we are. Maybe there is a new breed of horn players being, you know, being, being groomed out there, developed somehow. I don't know. Yeah. I'm hoping I wonder who they're listening to. Yeah. When, whatever it is. Yeah. 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 No, it was, it was quite, quite the pleasure. It was like, Oh man, this is like, he made the, mm. the gig, I think would have been fun anyway, but like I said, it was the first gig where we felt like a band and he very much felt like a part of the band, you know, that's cool, which is great. Yeah. And I'm sure he looked that way to the, you know, to the folks that were there. It was a weird night. It was, um, we had, it was the first spring day that we had mm. here in new England. It was, you know, 75 degrees during the day and really nice. And this gig was in downtown Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is just a nice place to be on a spring day. And, you know, we didn't start playing until uh, nine o'clock or so, whatever, you know, whatever the drill was. And uh, and people were in for like the first set and and we took a short break and came back. And for the second set, it was really interesting. We were fighting. Um, we were competing with the outdoors like people. It was still yeah. really nice outside. And so people would would dance for three or four songs. And then it did not matter what we played next. The dance floor would empty and they would all be outside. And. And we did this for the entire second set. And it was kind of it, once we sort of figured it out, it was like, OK, fine. So we'll play a couple of throwaway tunes. We played um, a throwaway from a dance gig standpoint. Not not that there's anything wrong with these songs, but, you know, we played like a one headlight or whatever. But we tried like a my girl or something to get people in. like it, it was the wrong time. They were going to be outside like, yeah. OK. And we started after two or three of these. At one point, shout was like the next thing on the list. The Isley Brothers, you know, and uh, really the Blues Brothers. And, uh, and it was like, man, I don't know if this is a good idea. You know, like we can't play shout with an empty dance floor. Like this is just not going to work. Right. And Gary's like, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to be fine. And, uh, I admired his confidence, but I did not believe in it. 
Uh, but he was right. Like we started the tune and by the first chorus, the dance, the people, everybody came in from outside. The dance floor was full. And, you know, we had them for, again, three or four songs and then back outside for a couple of, you know, navel gazers. And then, uh, you know, and then and then they came back in and, and finished the night with us. So but it was really interesting. It was like, yeah, we can't compete with, you know, the the first the, the, the winter thaw, you know, for the, from these folks. But yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, yep. It's like, OK, well, you just go with it. It's fine. Whatever. It's like I've played gigs in the summer where it's too hot inside that, you know, people go outside and like watch through the windows or whatever, too. So all the crazy things that happen at, at gigs. Spring is here. Spring is here. Yeah. I'm assuming you like things are warm and all that out there. Just got really nice. Past weekend was really nice. Oh, that's so, good. And, okay. yeah, it's such a long, wet, cold, you know, the winter here. Yeah. So green. It's been, you know, ridiculous. So it just feels nice. Like. The world is evolving and get back to business. And it it is. Up. Yeah, 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 exactly. We come out of, out of darkness and into the light again. Yeah. That sure. whole kind of thing. Yep. Cool, man. You got anything else for this show? Uh, I had a good question. Seems to be a question that comes up over and over again about the validity of using iPads. I think it deserves a lot of conversation though. And we should, we should really go down that path. So let's do it next time. Okay. All right. We'll do it next time for sure. Yeah. 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 Matt, Matt's question. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. We'll, we'll, I'm going to put it at the start of next week's show. Yeah. 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 Perfect. And uh, of course, if you have any questions or anything like this, uh, send it to us. Gig gab. Uh, oh, sorry. Feedback at gig podcast.com. Or you can visit us on Facebook at giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. But uh, however you find us, we would love to hear from you. It really does. It makes a huge difference for uh, for what we do here because it helps us tailor the show to you. So Yep. I'm glad you're feeling better, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you're back to a state where you can always be performing. Man, me too. <laughs> <laughs>